Hi, this is Pastor Bob Yandy. Today is day number four, speaking about the gifts and callings of God. Today we're going to find out about the callings that God has and how they work together with the gifts, and also how the gifts can work in your individual life. You are unique. Let's find out about it from the Word of God. For more than 40 years, Bob Yandian has been an expositor of the Bible, making seemingly complicated doctrine easy to understand. Grab your Bible and study the Word of God with Bob Yandian. Welcome back to Student of the Word with Pastor Bob Yandian as we are studying the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're taking up today. Today is day number four in the teaching of the gifts of the Spirit. And today we're gonna to be getting into the offices of the Lord Jesus Christ found in verses 12 through 27. While you're finding that again, let me just say thank you to all of those who are faithful watchers. Those of you who may be here for the first time today or maybe the second time, welcome back, glad to have you here. If you're here for the second time, you must have liked something because after the first time you came back or else I just really made you so mad you gotta come back and prove me wrong today. I trust that's not the case, but there are a few of you out there like that. But the rest of you, thanks for watching. Again, just welcome back to the broadcast. And we have been going for the past three days on the gifts of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. To be honest with you, the gifts of the Spirit are probably the least amount in this particular chapter, least amount of scripture. And so uh, the rest of of it, the rest of the chapter, the major part of it deals with the offices of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that will be found in verses 12 through 27. And I trust in this, it's going to help you to find your offices. In the past also, verse 7 through 11, the Holy Spirit that we've been studying, I trust in those verses that many of you have found the gifts that you believe are the ones that operate in you the most. It's not the fact you can hunt, pick, and choose them. There's certain ones God has chosen for you through the Holy Spirit, and you'll find yourself more inclined toward those. And just give you a little preview of coming attractions. Really, they're more geared around the calling God has for your life or the offices we're about to get into. In studying these, you can appreciate them. And in appreciating them, what I mean is, man, you begin to love God. You begin to love those that teach about it, love those that share about it. And I'm coming back to a point here is the fact that I've been called by God to do this. This is the things that I, I just love to teach the the word of God and unfold it. This is my calling. This is my gift. And there's certain gifts that I operate in. And again, I appreciate it, but this is, I have this to share with you. I'm at my utmost fulfillment when I am preaching and teaching the word of God and opening up and giving revelation of it. And I trust that you enjoy it too. For that reason, I simply ask you, would you consider being a partner with me? There's a great, great group around you that are watching right now that are a partner with this ministry, love this ministry, have contributed. In fact, I wouldn't be on the TV stations I'm on right now. I wouldn't be on the networks I'm on right now. I wouldn't have the books that I have. I wouldn't have all the public uh, published stuff that I have out there. And again, I'd love to have you become a partner with me also because there's other things we're gonna be doing in the days, months, and years to come that I want you to be a part of. The point of it is down here, you get to contribute financially. I may never see you, but in heaven, we'll get to see the rewards of it. We'll see the people's lives that were affected when they're through these broadcasts. We're going to meet people that say, listen, there was a guy watching your broadcast that, I mean, came out and told me about it. And I got saved by listening to what he had to say. And others will say, I got a calling on my life. And I, I got to go to Africa. I got to go to Somalia, some other country I was called to go to. And I went there, started a ministry, and a lot of people got saved. Here they are. I want you to meet them because you are a part of it by contributing to this broadcast. In heaven, we'll know everything. We'll know who gave to what. We'll know how the, all the results came, all the cause and effects of what brought this person to Jesus Christ and opened up a ministry for them, opened up a church for them, opened up a pastorate for them, and then the hundreds that they ministered to in their life, it just goes on and on and on. All started with a decision you made. I like Pastor Bob. I'm a given to his ministry. And with that seed, all these things begin to happen in your life and will go on throughout all of eternity. Glory to God. So if you'd like to become a partner with me, go to my website, bobyandian.com. Love to have you join. Love to have you as a partner. Go to bobyandian.com. On there, you'll find a place where you can become a partner with me. I'm looking forward to hearing from you that you became a partner. We're going to take a look today at verses 12 through 27. All right. Here in these verses of scripture, 
And uh, we just finished on the gifts of the Spirit. And again, this is not, all this was was a listing. There's no place in the Bible that explains them. You have to go back and see how they operate in Jesus' ministry, in the disciples' ministry, in the book of Acts, and there you'll see it. But it doesn't operate the same way in, in any two people. That's why, again, we just have them listed there. And I think what's interesting there in those verses of Scripture too, back there in verses uh, 7 through 11 on the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit not only gives the gifts, He works them. And it talks about he works this and works that, but he gives this and gives that. So the Holy Spirit gives you the gift, but he's the one that helps work them in you. It's not all up to you. It's not all up to your wisdom, not all up to your decision. No, it's depending on the voice of the Holy Spirit who's there to assist you. My mother, when uh, I was growing up, my dad had this great, great big car, 1948 Buick. This thing was huge, straight eight engine in it. My dad loved that car. My mom hated it. It was so heavy. And my dad, would he, he would get up to 100, 110 miles an hour out of some road somewhere and just enjoy the way that thing rode at such a high speed. My mom couldn't stand the car. You know why? Because it was heavy and it didn't have power steering. Power steering was just coming out by the time that car was four or five years old. And my mom wanted power steering. So finally, finally, I mean, my mom told told us we, she had to stand up. She was small. She was frail. She came to court. She had, she had to stand up in the car and turn the wheel as she went around a corner because that car was so heavy and didn't have uh, power steering. My dad got a 55 Chevy and it had and it had power steering in it. My mom loved that car. She used to put her, she used to put her finger in the steering wheel and turn the steering wheel with her finger and say, look at this, look at this. She was so happy with that car. Well, let me tell you what, without the Holy Spirit, our Christian life would be like trying to steer without power steering. The Holy Spirit, hey, listen, power steering doesn't steer the car. You still steer the car. It helps you. In fact, it does a lot of the work for you, but you have to put the finger in there first and turn it. When the Holy Spirit begins to move on you, he's waiting on you to step out in faith. Then he, like power steering, comes in to assist you. So again, the Holy Spirit not only gives the gifts, but he also works them in you. He works with you. You make the decision. You open your mouth. He fills it. Again, this is how we work together. Now we are moving in verses 12 through 27 to the offices of the Lord Jesus Christ. This particular section is, uh, again, for Jesus. Jesus Christ is over the offices in verses 7 through 11, where we were before this, the Holy Spirit is over the gifts. And there were nine gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now, we often think as we move into the offices of the Lord Jesus Christ that there are five of them, and there are five pulpit offices. These are found in Ephesians chapter 4. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors who are also teachers. There's a separate gift of teacher, but when a pastor is called, he's also a teacher. So you can be a pastor but you can't be a pastor without being a teacher, but you can be a teacher without being a pastor. So again, five of them are listed here. We'll find them also listed here, but we're also gonna go and find out there's not only pulpit offices, there's congregational offices, and we'll find those in Romans chapter 12. Now, the point that I'm trying to bring up here to, is this, is that we all have an office. We can all operate in the gifts of the Spirit. That was verse 11 or verse seven through 11. But also every one of us have an office. It may not be a pulpit office where you're up there instructing people, but there's also offices found within the body of Christ. Every Christian has an office. It was part of your actually forming in the womb where Paul said that I, he was actually called by God from his mother's womb. That calling represents an office. And so let's take a look. Let's open some of the verses here uh, in verses 12 through 27. Let's start with a few of the verses in the beginning. Verse 12, for as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. This was at the point of the new birth. The Holy Spirit baptized us into the body of Christ, whether we are Jews or Gentiles, whether we are slaves or free and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. Let's stop there for just a moment, talk about the body of Christ. This verse is telling us we are all members of the body of Christ. This did not exist in the Old Testament. The body of Christ exists in the New Testament. And to be honest with you, no writer of the New Testament talks about the body of Christ, Jesus the head, us the members of the body, except for the apostle Paul. And he mentions it on nine different occasions. He was impacted strongly by this teaching and mentions it so many times, but he's the only one who mentions it. 
Now in the book of Colossians, it deals with Jesus Christ, but very rarely brings up the body. The one who actually talks about them all working together as one on nine different occasions is the apostle Paul himself. And he brings out the fact that we became part of the body of Christ the moment we accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior. And that's why verse 13 says, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. This baptism occurred at the new birth. And I want you to notice the Holy Spirit baptized us into the body of Christ. Verse 18 is gonna tell us that when God placed us in the body of Christ, he placed us there as it pleased him. This verse tells us in verse 13, we were all baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. And the moment we were, it didn't matter what our nationality was, didn't matter what our social level was, whether we were, you know, a blue collar worker, white collar worker, didn't matter if we were male or female, black or white, you know, Hispanic, Oriental, it didn't matter. God just told us again, as he placed us in the body of Christ through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit baptized us or plunged us into the body of Christ. And on the way down, the Holy Spirit said to God, the father, where does this one go? He's a foot. All right, right or left. Okay, right foot. And he makes us the right foot. Another, and once he gets us there, we don't come back up. Now, this is not water baptism, all right? This is the baptism of the new birth. I call these dry baptisms because they really don't get us wet. We don't go into water with these, but they're true baptisms. In fact, the ones that are dry baptisms are real baptisms. Water baptism is not a real baptism. It's a symbolic baptism in front of people to show them with the emblems we have there, a human body going down into physical water, whether that water is standing still or running through a river or it might be the ocean, it might be a swimming pool, whatever it may be, that person is going under the water to show everybody out here that when I accepted Jesus, I was buried with him into the ground. And then once in the ground, I was quickened, made alive, and I came back up out of the ground with Jesus Christ. And now that I've risen to newness of life, I walk off in newness of life. So that's what, that's, that's uh, outward baptism. That is a wet baptism, but it's also symbolic of what happened to us at the new birth. And this happened as the Holy Spirit was the one who baptized us and God the Father told him where to place us in the body of Christ. Now that we are in the body of Christ, this verse goes on to tell us we're all one. I'm one with you, you're one with me. Oh, you say, yeah, but we're really not. Yes, we are. In our function, we are one together. No member of the body of Christ is superior over anybody except for the Lord Jesus Christ, the head over. And so I don't care what part of the body of Christ, that doesn't make you superior to anybody. No, it makes you part of the body of Christ. And even though you may be more visible than another part, such as hands again, as opposed to feet. We'll get into more of that later in these verses of scripture. Even though you're more visible, yet think about this. The body has to work together because otherwise the body's useless. We need each other no matter how small the thing is. You know, you might be sitting there in your kitchen right now watching me on a screen or something on TV. And suddenly, you know, I'm gonna come up to a break here a little bit or at the end of the broadcast, you might say, I'm kind of hungry. And so you look around, you see yourself an apple sitting over there and you decide you want to get that apple. First of all, the eye sees it. Next of all, the decision is made in the brain. The eye not only sees it, now you have to signal your feet to stand up because you've been sitting on a bar stool, you know, at the and in the kitchen. And so you signal your feet and they go down, you stand up, all the legs are involved in this thing and the eye still sees it over there, but the eye can't get it. The brain who now says, makes a decision can't get it. You have to stand up. And even though you used your feet to stand up, the feet don't get it. All this is aiming toward the time when your hand will reach out and grab that. All these parts of the body working together for something as simple as eating an apple. Then you put it into your mouth, you bite it with your teeth, all the different things that happen. All this goes together and suddenly you begin to see the importance of the body. In Romans eleven twenty nine, 29, we are told, the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. Many believers focus on the very last part of this verse, but it also teaches us that God works both the gifts and the callings together in each believer's life. We are living in a day when God wants every believer to find their place in the body of Christ. This five lesson series will help increase your understanding of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the fivefold ministry gifts, the body gifts, and how each of these gifts operate together to accomplish God's will in the earth. This powerful teaching series will help you discover your callings and find your place in the body of Christ. To order the gifts and callings of God, visit our website at bobbyendian.com. 
Theology Simplified is a practical guide to foundational biblical truth. Basic doctrines are not difficult, but easy to understand. They often become disguised as complicated or deep-sounding words, but the definitions are simple. Pastor Bob makes complex theological concepts clear and practical. Eight crucial doctrines are demystified. Redemption, justification, sanctification, reconciliation, predestination, election, propitiation, and glorification. These eight precepts, essential for all believers to understand, come to light as you read and arrive at a deeper understanding of the finished work of Jesus Christ. To order Theology Simplified, visit our website at bobyandian.com. Bob Yandian Ministries is training up a new generation in the Word of God. Because of your generosity, this teaching ministry is able to change countless lives. You will never know until you get to heaven how many people received Jesus, were filled with the Holy Spirit, healed, or found God's will for their life through your support and prayers. If you would like to become a partner with Bob Yandian, visit bobyandian.com and click on Partnership. Back to our apple we were talking about just before the break. You know what? That apple's sitting over there and you want to eat it. Again, the eye sees it, but the eye doesn't eat it. The eye sees it, the brain makes the decision, I want that, but the brain doesn't eat it. The brain now signals your leg, stand up off of that bar stool you're on and get over there and get it. So you stand up and you stand on your feet, but the feet don't eat it. All these parts are working together to get you over there. The legs begin to move and take you over there. You grab the apple with your hand, but the hand doesn't eat it. You put it in your mouth, but the mouth doesn't eat it. The mouth just bites it and you swallow it in your stomach. That's where the whole process then goes to work. All these parts working together. This is how the body of Christ works together. And, you know, one part, you know, helps another part, but the end result is we get the thing accomplished that God wants us to. We all need each other, no matter how small the parts of the body are. Let's just take an example for that. What about your small, your small toe? Let's just take the, the, the little toe on the left foot. Okay, you got up that morning and I mean, you're going in there and you're gonna watch this broadcast and you're sitting there and that toe is hurting all the time because you stubbed it big time. I mean, you started to walk around a corner and your, your uh, you know, naked foot, the toe rammed into the wall or into the, you know, into the woodwork around the wall. Anyway, and it hurts. I mean, it hurt bad and it's still hurting. So you get up to go get that apple and you limp over there. You could get over there a lot faster if this wasn't true, but man, you were in pain. And that little tiny toe is affecting everything for you getting there to that apple. All I'm saying is when one part of the body hurts, it hurts the entire body. It slows us down. That's why God wants us walking together in unity and care one for the other, because honestly, the whole body is moving differently because of that one toe. I'm now limping because of that toe. I'm now groaning because of that toe. I'm now complaining because of that toe. And I want to do everything I can to speed up the healing of that toe. This is how the body works together. We are all one in the body of Christ. The head is the one who makes the decisions. That's Jesus Christ. But Jesus doesn't go and heal the sick. We go heal the sick. We hear the signal from God. We go, we follow all the information that came through the gifts of the Spirit in the previous verses. And so this is it. Look with me at verse 15. Now we start getting into parts of the body that look at others and think they're somehow superior or inferior to other parts of the body. This goes on all the time. I mean, I've been around ministers that feel inferior toward other ministers or some that feel superior to other ministries. Let's take a look at verse 15. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not part of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the smelling? But now has God set the members, each one of them in the body as it has pleased him. You had no choice when you were born again as to what part of the body you would be. On the way down as the Holy Spirit planted you, plunged you into the body of Christ, the Holy Spirit asked God the Father, where does this one go? And God said, make that the little toe on the left foot. So you put you, and he did that. You had no choice in it. In fact, growing up in the Christian life helps you to understand where God put you in the body, not where you put you in the body. And then what happens in this verse of scripture, eventually we start to complain to God that we don't like the part of the body we're in and we're jealous of another part. I wish I was that part over there. Stop for just a moment and understand this. God has placed you in the body as it pleased him and his pleasure 
in this case is greater than your pleasure. Why don't you just grab yourself by the nap of the neck and say, I am where God wants me to be. And apparently if I'm where God wants me to be, his power will begin to operate in me. And if I try to do what I'm not supposed to do, it's not going to work. Let's go back to verse 15. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? What we have here is a less visible part, jealous of a more visible part. All right. I mean, when it comes to your foot, what do you do in the morning? Men, especially. All right. I mean, women, they, they look, you know, they have sh shoes that show, you know, the toenails and all this other stuff. Men don't have that. Okay. When a man sticks his foot in his shoe, first of all, he puts a sock over it and then he puts the sock and the foot into the shoe. And that's what he does. And the foot's down there where it can't see, it can't do it as far as that's concerned. And then whenever it can see the hand, it probably becomes jealous of the hand. Look at the hand. It's always out there for people to see. When's the last time this guy bought me a watch? But look, he bought a hand to watch. And if it had, again, if it, there could be competition, the foot can say to the hand, look how visible it is. I'm not visible like that. So think about this for just a moment, okay? The foot is jealous of the hand. And so if the foot is jealous of the hand, what it's simply saying is, I'm not visible, I'm not being seen. When's the last time your husband held feet with you? Okay, I know it sounds stupid, but you hold hands. Okay, when's the last time that he you know, took and rubbed your foot? Oh, well, I mean, he might do that, but the hand is so important. The hand is visible at all times. The hand's out there where people can see. We've got rings on, all the different things we have. And again, the foot doesn't have that. The foot might say, well, look at that. He cuts the fingernails, but he doesn't cut down here too often. Last time you begin to cut my toenails that are on me is when they begin to eat through the end of the socks. Now they, you know, now that that's happening, he'll cut them. But otherwise, it doesn't happen. He just just ignores me down here. I carry the weight all day long. The hand doesn't carry the weight. I do it all. And do I get thanks? Absolutely not. Well, you see, this is symbolic. Just take a church service for a moment. Are there parts less visible? Yeah, they're back there taking care of the children in a small class, part of the youth group back here. They're not part of the praise and worship leaders up here that are seen at all times. The pastor who's seen whenever he preaches, the associates, they come up and tell the things about what's going on in the church and announcements and all these things. And you might look at that and think, well, I'm back here working. Does anybody even know I'm back here working? They bring their children, they close the door, and I'm stuck back here with these kids for an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. And I've got to take care of us back here. And I wish I was up there where I could be seen too. All right? So we stop and think about that for just a moment. Think about this. When it comes down to it, even though you may be back here in a room somewhere, are you valuable? The answer is yes. Just like that little toe that if you didn't show up that day, you, in, you actually hurt the entire body that Sunday. The entire church suffers because you're not back there taking care of children. Just like that toe that got slammed into the wall and is hurting all day long, it actually impairs the movement. This is what happens when you're back. You say, yeah, but people don't know I'm back there. When's the last time you thought about your toe? It's whenever you slammed it into a wall that you really start to think about it. You know what? You appreciate it that time. In the meantime, you take its dependability for granted. Being dependable, being faithful is what God is looking for. And if you do it long enough, there'll come a time when God can exalt you. And oftentimes this is where you begin. I began back there taking care of children for a little bit, my wife and I, then I took care of the sound. I was not seen. I was working in the audio department and they gave me a class. Finally, they gave me a class and I had a small class that grew. And from there, I began to teach at Rama Bible Training Center. From there, I became the pastor of the church. All this began when I was just faithful to do what I was supposed to do. Ask yourself a question. Even though the foot may be looking at the hand saying, look how popular he, she is and all the different things about the foot speaking to the hand, ask yourself a question. Would you rather lose your hand or would you rather lose your foot? When it comes to visibility, one is more visible than another, but when it comes to important, both are equal. If I said, would you rather lose your foot or would you rather lose your hand? The first thing you think of, is there a third choice? Do I have to make this choice? The point of it is, is yes. And God would not rather lose the person back there in the, in the room taking care of children than he would the person that's up there speaking in front of the congregation. Both are equal when it comes to important. So the foot can say to the hand, I'm not as important as you are. I'm not really of the body. And I've seen this happen among ministers. Somebody stand next to somebody important. There was a time when I was at Ramah that this famous worldwide minister was asked to come and speak that time. And Kenneth Hagin couldn't be there to introduce him. He was gone. And they came to me as the dean of the instructor said, would you introduce him? I thought, me? Introduce him? 
He's known worldwide. I'm a nobody. They're asking a nobody to introduce a somebody. I sweated bullets for that morning, knowing that I had to stand there and introduce him. And he was one of my heroes. And I just simply said that I'm about to introduce one of my heroes. I study after him, all this. And when I got up, he just said, thank you. And he went on, began to minister that morning. He didn't know who the heck I was, but I knew who he was. I had seen him like a foot staring at a hand for many years, but I didn't get jealous of him. At that point, I considered it an honor to be able to introduce him. That's why if the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I am not the body, is it therefore not of the body? Look at verse 16. And if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? For if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the smelling be? And it all of a sudden begins to compare other parts. Now you have an ear around the corner from the eye. And the ear is saying, because I'm not the eye, I'm not the body. Like the foot speaking to the hand, I'm not as important. The ear spe- talks about the eye just around the corner. And the ear says, when's the last p- person that actually looked into me? I mean, he looks into her eyes, but he doesn't look deep into her ears. I'm back here. When's the last time he cleaned me, took care of me? No, he forgets about me until all of a sudden he realizes one day I'm pretty dirty back here and he begin to wash me. No, it, the, but the eyes ride around the corner. It might be a woman. Oh, I get an earring now and then, but look at this. There's no ear makeup. There's eye makeup. And look at all the eye makeup that she gets. And I mean, she brushes those eyelashes out and makes them longer, but I'm just back here. And most of the time, she pulls her hair over me where people can't see me. But never is there hair over the eyes. No, they can always see the eyes. And all of a sudden, jealousy begins to come. When's the last time again he looked deep into the ear? Never. But they look deep in the eye. The eye listen, there's poems written about the eyes, but there's no poems written about the ears. The eyes are called the windows to the soul. You look in there and you can see a person and you understand him. That's what the eyes are compared to. But the ears are not a window to anywhere. And this, what this saying, but it comes down to this, even though the one part might be jealous of another, think about this for just a moment. Would you rather lose your hearing or would you rather lose your sight? I don't know. Is there a third choice? No, there's no third choice. Which one are you going to lose? You're going to lose one of them. And you begin to think when it comes to actual function, both are equal. That's how God looks at us. Jesus is the head. I might be that little toe on the left foot but he didn't want to lose me any more than he wants to lose himself. Why? Because he loves me as much as he loves himself. I am as important to the body of Christ as Jesus Christ is. I know that sounds a little arrogant, but what I'm simply coming down to, looking at it from Jesus' viewpoint, I am just as important as he is. Therefore, if the ear should say, because I'm not the eye, I am not of the body, is it then not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, then where were the hearing? Again, this happens everywhere where people look at the pastor up there and they think, oh, he's so important. But then the rest of the staff's out there scratch their head going, am I important or not? The answer is yes, you are. You don't need recognition. You don't need people seeing you. What you need to understand is if I wasn't here, it would hinder the church service. Just like if the pastor wasn't here, it would hinder the church service. I am just as important to Jesus Christ as this. And if I'm faithful back here, that's what God is looking for, for me to be faithful to do what I'm called to do. Like a faithful foot, like a faithful ear, simply doing what God has asked you to do. This is what God is looking for. So again, in verse 18, it says, God has set the members, every one of them in the body, as it has pleased him. You are a member of the body of Christ. You need to value that. You may not know which part you are, but all I'm simply saying is what ministry you stand in. If you feel compelled to minister to children, to youth, if you feel ministered uh, in in praise and worship, or if you just feel like you're, you're called to stand there at the door and greet people coming in, that is an important part of the body of Christ. We'll see you tomorrow. You can order resources, become a partner, or browse free articles and podcasts. You can also join our mailing list and receive weekly devotions and the latest ministry updates. Visit bobyandian.com. To contact us by mail, use the address on your screen. We'll see you next time on Student of the Word with Bob Yandian.